Hello, and welcome to the Communication Solution Podcast with Casey Jackson and John Gilbert. I'm your host, Danielle Canton. We love to talk about communication, we love to talk about solutions, and we love to talk about providing measurable results for individuals, organizations, and the communities they serve. Welcome to the communication solution that will change your world. Welcome everyone. We are here for another amazing episode with Casey Jackson, the communication solution. And we have a very special guest with us today. We have Allie Gibson. She's the director at Frontier Behavioral Health, a community uh, behavioral health organization. And uh, we're gonna talk a little bit more about being an MI geek because I'm pretty sure that's what Allie might be. Um, and of course, you guys know me, Danielle. I'm kind of like, you know, the little baby new MI geek. Um, but I wanna just turn it over to you, Casey. I know you have a great relationship with Allie and uh, we can kick this off. Yeah, I've been excited about this conversation. Allie and I have known each other for quite a while. Um, and one of my favorite organizations to go to because it's, <laughs> Allie's always in the room raising her hand. Uh, like, okay, I thought about this last night. Is anybody not gonna say anything? I'm gonna talk. Um, so <laughs> that's, that's so I always am excited when I get to do trainings that Allie's involved in. But Allie, go ahead and tell us a little bit more about just your role at, well, your role at Frontier Behavioral Health. But what I'm, I want people to hear just kind of what was your moment, like the, the moment where it went from just being a training on another clinical technique to what all of a sudden grabbed your attention? Like, wait a second, this is, this is different. Like this is, this is catching my attention in a different way. So we'll just turn it over to you. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm the director of child and family outpatient downtown and the wise program, uh, which is wrap around with intensive services for youth. So my programs work with um, the youth Medicaid population, uh, ranging from, you know, very acute to very severe um, issues. So that's a little bit about what I do at FBH. Um, oh, gosh, I think I always like to unpack things backwards. So I think that's when when it happened for me. So I, I remember sitting in the very first train, the trainer training. And kind of thinking like, I don't really know why I'm here, but I'm here. Um, and we were doing a role play and you were my partner, Casey. And we were talking about working out in the morning, I think was my, where I had ambivalence. Yes. And um, I just, I got to thinking about like, okay, I'm already somebody that works out consistently. And so if I unpack backwards, what I know about behavior change, what I know about motivational interviewing, why do I do that? And I think I spent a really long time thinking about that. Like, this is part of my life that is so habitual now, but how did it get to being so habitual? Like there had to be something tied, you know, atop of the mountain that's tied to this. So I started unpacking some things backwards for myself of like, how did I get here to this drastic change? And then it just was like, all these light bulbs came on and I it's like, holy shit, this is, <laughs> this is really good stuff. Like, oh my God, if I can just resolve all this ambivalence, keeping this in mind, I really like to do things very efficiently and quickly. And so, you know, I started having these conversations with myself over the years of like, okay, if I'm feeling torn about this, if I were to do what's in alignment with my values, what would I do? And it just felt like things were so clear. Yes. Um, and it felt like all of the kind of BS in life just yeah. faded away. Like what was truly important was just there and it was clear. And I felt better, like as a human being, like I just felt less stressed, um, less torn in all these directions, more confident in what I was doing. Like if somebody was like, well, why would you do it that way? I just, I knew, and I spoke, I spoke from the heart about it and I, you know, didn't spend time questioning myself anymore because things just felt super clear. So, you know, that, that fascinates me when you say that, I think because what, when I hear you say that, the first thing I resonate with is in some ways it really is that simple. And yeah. when you say it, it really sounds that simple. And when you live it, it really is that simple, but for whatever reason, it's really complex for people to be able to untangle all that. Um, and I think it is, maybe what it is is because the 
the amount of detail on both sides of the teeter-totter, on both sides of the ambivalence, on both sides of when you're contemplating something, there's so much detail, there's so many trees that people can't get their head above the trees to get to what the top of the mountain is, you know, to what are their deeper values. Because once you get that cadence down, most situations we have ambivalence with, you just go, which one aligns with my values? And mm -hmm. and and I. so the next thought that I have is, for myself, what I know is there is some predictability that as soon as I get clear what my values are and look at the situation, I still do have sustained talk. But I get to a place where I think you and I are in a similar place, and it's just like I don't even allow myself sustained talk much anymore because it's just one it's just a delay in me taking a step towards where i want to go mm -hmm. and so i think that's my rationale in my own brain it's just like the more you give any attention to your own sustained talk it literally is every moment that you could be working towards having a better quality of life and being closer to the top of your mountain danielle <laughs> yes I'm, just, I'm, I'm like i'm listening to this going oh my gosh it sounds like a really great place because you know people listening to this to this podcast you know there's a range of people there's some geeks yeah. i'm sure listening um and then there's also people that are a little more new to this and i'm wondering when you think about motivational interviewing you guys mentioned the top of the mountain yeah. um can you talk a little bit more about that because when i'm listening to both of you i'm like it sounds like there's one north star for you mm -hmm. and it's so maybe that could really help some people listening about that. Maybe, I don't know if it's the first step, but understanding what's at the top of your mountain so that you can keep going to that when you're in a moment of ambivalence or confusion. You know, it's, it's one of the things that probably, I think in my trainings that I'm better known for is the uh, coming up with the focus mountain concept. And, and where it came from is when Miller and Rolnick came out with the four processes in the third edition of the motivation Training book. Like there was processes before it was very technique, very spirit. You know, there's the spirit of MI, there's technique behind MI, but they were trying to really dial in on what were the processes and they came out the processes and it was engaged was first, which is high empathy. Then focus was second. And, and traditionally focus is on kind of goals, long-term goals. But the more I was researching around motivation, is yeah you want you have goals but what would what click with me and kind of my always my visual brain is if my goal is to break the brick and i aim for the brick you break your hand um you have to punch three to four inches behind the brick um, and you focus three to four inches behind the brick and that's where your that's where your inertia and the momentum goes and that's what i started thinking about you have to get somebody truly inspired when you listen to what ali was talking about to get somebody that focused in their own personal life it's got to be beyond the goal and that's where i started thinking about what are our deeper values and then you know there was things being written about the world values index and there's the value sort card sorts it's always been part of motivational thing, but there there were so many in the values card sort and some of them when i looked at them and looked at literally what were the semantics around what values were some of them weren't values so then I was on this quest to find, okay, what are that, what are, what are core human values? Which ones are cross-cultural core human values? And then once I distilled all that out, it became, that's what human beings are striving for. That's what I'm, that would be the top. And then literally in my brain, I remember, I remember that's the top of my mountain. Where am I trying to get to? What's, what's, what am I, what am I trying to ascend to in my life? And that's where I started building whole focus mountain concept. And so it, it was fascinating because that was just the way my, my brain went. And obviously, you know, I'm not, not the innovator, but then it's, you know, the Simon Sinek stuff. So many people have talked about the why and the value behind it, but it just, all of a sudden those tumblers fell into place and it's like, wow. And then all the trees at the bottom of the mountain. So the trees at the bottom of the mountain are all the stuff that we get caught in 24, seven, 365. It's our jobs, it's our kids, it's our family, it's relationships, it's divorce, it's social media, it's, you know, friend groups, it's hobbies, it's everything around us that absorb our time 24, seven. And we can be absor absorbed in that stuff 24 seven and make zero progress towards the top of our mountain, which is what our deeper core values are, or we get distracted by those. So focus mountain was just a, a way that once you get engaged with people, have them get really clear about where, what are their ultimate values? What are their goals? And what you said, Danielle, is what's their North star. Yeah. And so there's a couple of handfuls of values at the top of focus mountain, you know, as I designed it and 
what Ali's talking about this, and this is the way that I live my life as well too, is it's, it's, it's that kind of Roy Disney quote is once you get clear what your values are, your decisions become more clear. Um, and so it's the same thing. It's like, okay, if this is my value and this thing's Ali and I've talked about, if integrity is my value and I look at this situation, well, I know what I need to do. I don't want to do it. <laughs> I know what I need to do. If well-being is a value that I have, well, I know what I need. There's no argument to that. There's arguments to be made, but there really aren't legitimate. If you're going to get your behavior in line with your values, there's a, a the way Ali talked about it seems so simple and clear to me because it's like, yeah, that's exactly how I think about it. It's like, this either in line with your values or it's not in line with your values. The conversation with your spouse, this is either in line with your values or it's not in line with your values. The way you're talking to your children right now, it's either in line with your values or not in line with your values. And it doesn't make you perfect and it doesn't make you fallible by any chance because you, you I trip up all the time. But it is an immediate reset when it's over and over again that is my behavior in line with my values. I do this in my own business in terms of contracts, in terms of hiring, in terms of you know personnel, in terms of you know partnerships. It's like, is your behavior in line with your values? And I can come up with 50 reasons why I want to do it a different way. But ultimately, it's just like, well, you can choose to do that. It's just not in line with your values. And it's just like, oh, I hate this method. Um, because it gives you no escape. There's no rocks to hide under. There's nowhere to hide. There's no desk to hide under. It's just either you're standing there with yourself going, is my behavior in line with my deeper values? And it's either yes or no. Yeah. And I love, uh, Allie, how you just jump right to it. You're efficient. So you're like, I'm not going to waste time. <laughs> yes. That's Allie. Well, <laughs> yes, I hate wasting time. Uh, so I think for me to the, the values piece is so important because in in all reality, we have more bad days than good. I, I just feel like life is complex. We are complex as human beings. There's a lot going on. And so if, you know, if we're working out, like Casey said, the punching the brick, if that's all we're trying to accomplish, there's going to be a lot of days we don't do that. And so then we get all of this negative stuff that happens. Whereas if it's about three inches behind the brick, it just makes it, it makes it a lot easier. You know, it's, it's this, you're not arriving at this destination. I always think for health, I think a lot of things, motivational interviewing in terms of health and wellness, yeah. if your goal is to lose 30 pounds every day, you don't do that your brain sending all these really disruptive things to your body, your self-talk yeah. is super negative. But when your goal is to move your body so you can be the mom you wanna be and you can be alive for your kids and you can support them and or whatever it is, then that 10 minute workout or that 90 minute workout, it, it doesn't matter. You were living to that value. You were living to that meaning. And when you wake up in the morning and you have a runny nose and all your kids are crying, not that that ever happens, and you're trying to get out the door to work out, it's like, I have to do this because this is the type of mom I am. This is who I want to be for my kids. You know, it's this bigger picture. This is who I want to be as a human being in the world. There's personal responsibility, personal accountability with that. And so it just makes it during those really chaotic times when integrity is the goal or autonomy or yes. fulfillment. Yes it just makes it so much easier because you're not attached to these trees. You know, Ellie, what, what clicked with me as you were talking about that as well too, is because I was thinking about, okay, I'm looking at the sustained talk for other people in terms of why this, why, what makes this hard when it seems fairly clear and fairly simple, fairly. And what, what strikes me is because I go back to now the brain science side of it and looking at trauma and stress and because we go into fight, flight, and freeze. So when you got runny noses and kids screaming, your brain goes into reactivity mode unless you keep it up into the executive functioning in the prefrontal cortex of going, they're not dying. No one's in imminent risk. This is normal in a normal family. It's healthy for me to handle it this way. Even if it doesn't look that way to onlookers, this really is a healthy way to deal with it. And they're going to be healthier and I'm going to be healthier in the long run. That's all prefrontal cortex. That's all executive functioning. And that is not how it feels in the moment when you want to go back to bed, get divorced and move to Bora Bora. Like that's, a, that's a, you know, it's like, you know, it's like that. That's just not your body's just like, I need to get the heck out of here, you know? Yeah. Um, and I think that's, I think that's the difference is how focus mountain 
I know keeps me out of the fight, flight, freeze, you know, fawn kind of perspective. That's just like, you no, know, keep moving forward. And what I'll say, one of the things that's interesting, because I get it, <laughs> I've lived it before, but what you said is there's more bad days than good days. What's fascinating, and Danielle, you and I have talked about this a lot. Uh, about a year and a half ago, I, I woke up um, one day, I was had meditation, woke up in the morning and and I had this startling reality that I was living my vision statement, not my mission statement, my vision statement, because I have more good days than bad. And, you know, and I've got twin 14 year olds and I've got, you know, run a business and travel and have a spouse and all these other things that other people have. And it's, and I thought, how is this possible? And it's literally what you're talking about is because when I think of it from a mountain perspective, when you start to get above the tree line, because the, there's so many trees in our lives of, of family and work and kids and you, just everything that's going on, um, there's a point if you keep trudging towards the top of the mountain every single day and you start getting closer and closer to your vision statement because you stick to your mission, you start having more good days than bad days. Because every day is just like, I can feel, I can feel what's happening in my life is different. And I'm not stressed because why literally when you look from an mi lens it's because i spend less time in resistance talk and sustain talk which is what drains our brain it's like literally what you'd said you know just amount of energy that is that negative self-talk that i haven't lost the 30 pounds and then the guilt and the shame and the resistance talk in our own brain and the beating ourselves up and then the sustain talk and the excuses i think that is where people spend most of their time but when your brain doesn't spend the time there when you literally have made a decision i'm staying focused on my values i'm not going to give myself excuses and blame and i'm just going to take one step forward and then one step forward and then one step forward and then slide three steps back but go one step forward and one step forward and one step forward you have more good days than bad days mm -hmm. and that's the thing that i think is so fascinating when you when you truly live it this way and there and i keep going to back to how the dichotomy between how complex this is and how simple this is at the same time yeah that's amazing. It just, Allie, when I heard you describe how you just, you're efficient and you, you're like, I'm just, I, I will move really quickly through resistance and sustain talk. Yes. Um, but you also said most people um, have more bad days than good days. Do you, have you noticed what Casey just said is the more you're doing what you said you're doing, the more you're having good days instead of bad? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's kind of my experience too, is like every day is my staff always, my supervisors always make fun of me because they're like, Allie's always fine. Everything's like, oh, I know I'm fine. I'm fine. And I tell them, but I truly am. Like, I truly am fine. Like there can be these large things that happen at work or at home. And, you know, I have emotional reactions, which yeah. would surprise some people, but I have <laughs> emotional reactions, but I, I cycle through them so quickly. And then I'm like, no, I'm fine. It's cool. Um, Again, because I just, I don't want to spend a lot of time there. I, it's not a good use of energy. It's not efficient or productive. Um, and so I find that too. And I, I think that's where I could use uh, some more experience with accurate empathy with other people who spend <laughs> more time there. Because um, I just, I look at, you know, friends or colleagues or, you know, hear stories and I'm like, it's just like Casey said, it's so, it's so simple. Um, but why does it seem so complex? And again, just trying to unpack it backwards of, well, how often do, do you have a space where you're encouraged to use that executive functioning yeah. or that someone kind of pushes you out of that? We are a very emotionally driven culture. I mean, yes. there's a lot of conversations I've been a part of where people feel their emotions are so objective and forgetting that they're actually really subjective. That's your experience and trying to transition people to look more at the objective piece, look more at the executive functioning piece um, because it just, it, in the long run, you'll feel better. So I don't know if that answers your question, but I think it's, oh it's one of those things as a, as a society and a culture, we're very emotionally driven, especially in the last three years, you know, that's kind of become like the social nicety is, you know, you check in and how are you? And yes, I, and just, oh my gosh, I'm like so excited because <laughs> I need to know more. From you. I need to know more from you guys on this because what you just said, even the tone of your voice, Allie, that's what I experience is like, how are you? When something bad happens, there's this almost like invitation into yes. 
like leading them into mm -hmm. the re the um, resistance talk or the sustained talk. Like and shared misery. Let's all just yeah, share this together yeah. and stay here. And yeah, yeah so very so interesting. When you um, said that, what strikes me about it is that fascinates me. It just like my brain just started going crazy on the cultural piece of it because it what you're saying, it just hit me all of a sudden of, of just movies in general and is that Girl's commiserating dirty. is romanticized. Entire movies are based off of commiserating. Like, and, yes, and, yes. and the, the arc is life sucks. We go to Vegas and party and have the best time. And then we go back to our miserable lives. Um, and that's the arc of the movie, you know, it's just like, and maybe there's some good, but the majority of it is just life sucks. Life sucks. We commiserate with each other. We go to coffee and talk about how bad things are. We go to have a glass of wine and talk about how bad things are, you know, the movies that, you know, the cords wrapped around the parents' feet and the kids are screaming and, you know, dinner's not made, dinner's burning. Like, it's just, that's just, that's the romanticized narrative of, of the American life, you know? Um, and I think it's why younger generations have an obsession with social media because every influencer is a millionaire, you know? So then there's this glamorized life on the flip side. It's like, well, why are we going to be miserable? We don't choose to be miserable. It's, Let's put on makeup and and you know do TikTok dances, um, you know even though they're depressed and str struggling, um, you know it, it's just fascinating. I never really thought about how romanticized commiserating is and how almost delusional being happy is. Um, mm -hmm. That friends don't get together and be happy and they just get together and they're happy together and everybody's just happy together and talking about the positive things in their life. It's like well that's delusional. Um, they're not grounded in reality because life sucks. You know, it's just fast. I just hadn't quite looked through that lens before. Yeah, right. it's super interesting. And I mean, I get feedback all the time from people of like, you know, when you start a meeting, you just go straight into the agenda. Like, can we take some time to talk about our weekend, to talk about, to really spend time in this downstairs brain in this lower part. But the problem is the conversation never transitions upwards. Right. right. So it always feels like a direct halt. Okay, now she's going to make us get back on track. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's just never a smooth transition. To, okay, we got it out. Let's just now let's move on with our own agenda. And it's like, it just feels like, yeah, because that's work. <laughs> and we don't like work. And we don't want to be doing work. And I don't even want to be at work. So let's just talk about our weekend instead. Yeah, um, and how miserable work is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's fa it's, yeah, that's just fascinating. Fascinating, fascinating. Yeah, the more the more you use the tools of motivational interviewing, the more um, you really do step out of the drama and trauma of life. Um, doesn't mean it like to your point, Casey, it's not like it's not there. Um, right. Or you don't, you can identify the top of Focus Mountain and the weeds you're in and know kind of your direction. And it could still be like, God, but I don't want to do it. And you got to shut that off and and take action. But um, the more you do that work, the more you're still surrounded by the majority of people who are in it, in the drama and trauma. Um, and so you can be perceived, like Ali, you mentioned, as maybe not having as much empathy, at least empathy the way people think empathy is, which is come right. on yes. in here in the misery with me. Yes. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm really curious, you know, how an idea, Casey, of how to transition in for somebody in a meeting who really does want to stay out of the drama and trauma and keep the team uplifted. How do you get from that, giving them a little bit, because that's how people feel connection, right? The I emotion. Think, I think part of it, Danielle, I think this goes into why it's not so simple. There's the simple part that literally, if you just think that clearly and that cleanly, it can be that simple in some way the clear it can be that clear not that simple that that's more accurate way to say it. it can be that clear but not necessarily simple where the complexity comes in is all the things that people are stressing over are real so the lack of finances the abuse that just happened those are real things so you can't make light of human experience by any stretch or minimize it by any experience or any stretch of the imagination so these things that happen to us that pull us into sustained talk and resistance talk are real deep, complex human issues that you can't just snap your fingers and go, okay, get your behavior in line with your values. I mean, that's, that's, that's way oversimplifying it. I, at the more that I study these things, what I look at is, and I, for myself, what I know is I have a very distinct amount of bandwidth 
a very distinct limited amount of bandwidth. And it's the, it's the decision that I can go deep. I can get emotional. I can even, I can even, you know, feel justified or rationalize and why I'm not moving forward, which is very human to do, but I've just learned that doesn't yield much for me. And, and I think this is the, where Allie and I relate is I'm not as efficient and focused as Allie is, but I do know I want to be really good at what I do and I want to have a good quality of life. So I don't want to, I don't want to waste bandwidth on any given day on things that yield nothing. Um, so, and part of being human is I don't mind commiserating. And I think that is where, you know, mm. I, I, there's something about, there's a richness in life of being able to go, oh, this sucks. Like, this is so hard and I don't want to do it. And I want to throw myself on the ground and throw my temper tantrum um, and then pour a glass of wine. Uh, <laughs> so like all those things I love to do, but that's not how I'm going to spend half of my bandwidth. You know, it's like, I'll give 10 to 20% of just being a human, imperfect person, being able to do it. But then there's days where it's like, I don't even want to give 20% because I just know it's such a, it's just not, it's not going to get me closer to the top of my mountain. And I can see and smell the top of my mountain now. And I just want to get there. And, and every time I get, wake up and I get there a, a day closer to it, the sun is brighter and warmer. The quality of my life is better. The quality of my relationships are better. And it's like, why would I spend time doing things that will detract from that? Mm. Um, you know, and that's that values driven life that I think for me is just, you know, propelled me so far forward with how I live. And then just with motivational interviewing as well. This has been part one of a two-part podcast. We hope you'll join us for the second portion. Thank you for listening to the Communication Solution Podcast with Casey Jackson and John Gilbert. As always, this podcast is about empowering you on your journey to change the world. So if you have questions, suggestions, or ideas, send them our way at Casey at IFIOC.com. That's C-A-S-E-Y at ifioc .com. For more information or to schedule a training, visit ifioc.com. Until our next communication solution podcast, keep changing the world.